Okay, so hello. Um, I'm with CAI Paper Solved, and today we are solving a O level physics paper. Um, the variant is May June 11, May June 22, variant 1 1. Okay, so um, let's, without further ado, let's get it started. Um, for question one, um, a length of copper wire is labeled length 0 0.5 meters and diameter 0 0.5 millime millimeters. Which instrument are the most suitable to measure accurately the length and the diameter of the uh, wire? Um, so, for this question, uh, we have to look at the lengths. First of all, uh, the length of the wire is 0 0.5 meters and the diameter is 0 0.5 millimeters. These are like the key quantities that we have to deal with. So for the length, which is 0 0.5 meters, it's pretty evident that we are going to have to um, measure it using a meter rule instead of uh, vernier calipers because um, a meter rule can measure, uh, accurate, can accurately measure 50 centimeters easily. So as a result, um, we can eliminate number C and T. So the answer is between A and B. And so uh, while measuring the diameter, um, it's 0 0.5 millimeters. Now, of, obviously, it's not going to be measured using a meter rule because the smallest division of a meter rule is one centimeter. So it cannot really measure 0 0.5 millimeters now, can it? So the answer has to be B. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. A driver drives a car at uniform velocity along a road. The driver sees a hazard and applies the brakes. What is the car's motion as it moves through the thinking distance and as it moves through the braking distance? Now, let's first define what thinking distance and braking distance is. So, thinking distance is basically the distance that the car travels after the driver has been made aware that he has to brake the car, uh, but before the brakes have actually been applied. So since the brakes have not yet been applied, it would still be moving in uniform velocity. So as a result, we can, um, we can eliminate number option A and B. It has to be between C and D. Now after and now braking distance is basically the distance traveled by the car after the brakes have been applied. As such, it is common sense that it is going to decelerate. And so the answer is going to be C. Okay, so let's move on to um, question number three. Uh, the diagram represents the moon in its orbit around the Earth. Which arrow represents the direction of the resultant force acting on the moon at the instant shown? Now, um, this is a very common question, but it is a very easy question as well. So for any for any object that is in circular motion, we know that the force, it has a resultant force, even though the velocity is uniform, it would have a resultant force towards the center, towards the center of the circle that it's traveling. I mean, the velocity, the direction of resultant force is always going to be perpendicular to the um, direction of velocity, we can say. So as a result, it is always going to be towards the center. And as such, in this case, the answer should be A. Okay, let's move on to question number four. Uh, the mass M of an object is related to its weight W and the gravitational field strength G. Which equation shows the relationship? Um, so this is this is actually quite easy. We we know that um, we know the equation W equals to mg, weight equals to mass into gravitational acceleration, which is 9.81. So if we make m the subject, as we can see in all of these options, m is the subject. So if we make m the subject, uh, the equation would be m equals to W by g. So the answer should be. Let's move on to question number five. A plastic cube of density rho is compressed so that each of its sides becomes one half of its original length. What is the new density? So for this question, let us first draw the, uh, let us illustrate the cubes. So in the first scenario, scenario one, 
um, for scenario one, um, let's draw the cube first. Um, this is the cube. Um, it's something like that. Um, it's a bit slanted. I'm not very good at drawing. So, okay. So it's a cube, and let's assume that all of its lengths are L. Since it's a cube, all of its sides are equal. So it's going to be L, L, and L over here. So, um, so we can from this we can write rho, which is the density, is going to be mass. Let's assume that the mass is m by L cube. Now, for the second scenario, scenario two. For the second scenario, the box has been compressed. Um, the compressed box should look something like this. And let's draw the lines. Yeah. So all of its sides are L by 2. So therefore, the volume is going to be L by 2 whole cube, which is L cube by 8. So in this scenario, the density, let's name it rho 1, is going to be mass m by L cube by 8. Now, it is important to understand that since the box has been compressed, it's not been broken or it's not been cut or something, it's been compressed, which means that the amount of substance for, uh, for scenario 1 is the same as of scenario 2. So, as such, the mass, the mass is going to remain constant. So, the mass is going to be m. So, let's, um, let's rearrange this. We can write it as rho 1 equals to 8 m by l cube and then from here we can um, we can write rho 1 equals to 8 rho so the end so this is our answer rho 1 equals to the 8 rho so the answer should be d okay now let's let's move on to the next question this question is about stability, uh, we can see. Uh, four glass objects have square bases of equal area. Uh, which uh, object is the least stable? Now, when it comes to stability, two things are very important. Uh, one is the area of the base, and the other is the height of the center of mass from the, from the base. So uh, since it's written that the area of all of these objects have equal area at its base we uh, so that is not a factor for us now so we have to focus on the height of the center center of ma center of mass from the base so we know for a the height is somewhere around here yeah it's somewhere around here for b the height is somewhere around here for C, the height is going to be a bit higher. It's going to be around here. And for D, uh, we can see that it's a uniform object. So for D, it's going to be in the midpoint as well. It's uh, similar to number question, to option A. Since both of them are uniform objects, they have their center of masses at the center. OK, so. We can so now let's compare the uh, the distances between the center of masses and the base. So from here we can see that uh, for option C the center of mass is the highest. The, it is the furthest from the uh, from the base. So we can uh, so the and the question asks us for the least stable, the mo not the most stable, the least stable. As such, the answer is going to be C. If the question asked us the, that which one was the most stable, then the answer would have been B, as it is the it, it has the closest center of mass to the ground. Okay, so let's move on to question number seven. The initial pressure of a volume V1 is, is fixed uh, of a fixed mass of gas is P1, and the gas expands at a constant temperature. Uh, until it has a volume V2 and pressure P2. So which statements about the pressure and the volume of the gas is 
not correct. It's a common mistake for people to think that, that uh, which one is correct. Um, it's a very common mistake. I myself make that mistake quite a lot. So it's important to notice the fact that they're asking for the incorrect option, not the correct one. So let's look at the um, look at the options. For option A, the pressure is measured in newton per meter cube. Um, that is completely wrong because we know for a fact that pressure is equals to force by area. As such, its units should be its units should be um, either pascals or it could be newton per meter square or atm which is atmosphere so it cannot be newton per meter cube so it has to be the answer has to be a but still let's look at the other options as well uh, pressure multiplied by volume is a constant yes uh, it this one is correct because we know for a fact that uh, from boyle's law we know that p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 so we know that it's a constant. Um, C pressure is directly proportional to one by volume, which essentially means that pressure is inversely proportional to volume, which we already know thanks to Boyle's law as well. And D, the ratio of V1 to V2 is equal to the ratio of P2 to P1. Um, it, many people think that this is the wrong answer. Many people would make the mistake, but it's actually, this one is correct. And we can prove that by rearranging this equation over here. We can write it as P1 by P2 equals to V2 by V1 if we like cross multiply. And if we um, reciprocal it, we can see that V1 by V2 is equals to P2. 2 by p1 not p1 by p2 so yeah this this one is valid as well so the answer was the first option which is a so let's move on to question number eight a stone falls at terminal velocity in air what is equal to the change in pro gravitational potential energy of the stone now for this question many people make the mistake and simply state that the change in gravitational potential energy is the change in kinetic energy now while there is kinetic energy present um, any move, moving object has kinetic energy the change in gravitational potential energy in this case will not be equal to kinetic energy rather the answer should would be d would be equal to thermal energy it's because that it the object is falling in terminal velocity terminal velocity is a for we, is a form of constant velocity constant velocity constant velocity and we know for a fact that for uh, the equation of kinetic energy is ek equals to half m sorry kind change in kinetic energy ek change change equals to half m v2 square minus v1 square now if the cons uh, if the velocity is constant for example if the velocity is 5 meter per second we can write it as half m 5 square minus 5 square because the, it's not changing, right? It's falling in terminal velocity. As such, the velocity is always going to be the same in all cases. So V2 is always going to be equal to V1. As such, the change in kinetic energy will always be zero. So the answer, but energy has to be converted in some form, right? So as a result, the energy is converted to thermal energy. Uh, Temperature, change in temperature is not a form of energy and neither is friction between the stone and the air. And yeah, so the answer would be D. Let's move on to question number nine. Uh, air, water in a river is used to turn a turbine and the water flows downstream. What is the type of power source described? Uh, yes, this is more like a general knowledge question. And this, this sort of... Um, Powers, a power source is called a hydroelectric power source. Uh, when water falls on a turbine and turns the turbine, thus producing, um, thus producing energy. So we have hydroelectric power plants uh, that work that way. So yeah, it's more like a general knowledge question, and the answer is going to be a hydroelectric power plant. 
I mean hydroelectric. Okay, let's move on to question number 10. A uh, load is pulled by rope attached to a motor. The resultant force exerted by the rope on the load is shown in the diagrams. In each diagram, the load moves in the direction of the force shown and takes 10 seconds to travel 1 meter. In which diagram does the motor work with the greatest power? So, in this question, all of these objects have moved 1 meter in 10 seconds. Okay, they're moving in 1 meter for 10 seconds. Now how to calculate power? So to calculate power, um, sorry, to calculate power the equation that we are going to use is is uh, work done equals to FT. It's a force into distance traveled in the, in the direction of the force and if we divide it by time we can obtain power. So power is equals to FD by T. So this is the formula that we are going to use in this case. This is the formula that we are going to use in all of these cases. Now we know that there in all of these um, in all of these scenarios distance and time are the same. We've seen that um, it's written that in each diagram the f load moves in the direction of the force shown and takes 10 seconds to travel 1 meter. So in all of these scenarios they move 1 meter for 10 seconds. So as such can't we consider D and T to be, uh, to be a constant? So if we consider D and T to be a constant we can write that power is directly proportional to force given that D and T is constant. Given As such, um, since power is directly proportional to force, the one with the greatest power is going to be the one with the greatest force, and which is going to be option A. Yeah, which is going to be option A. So let's move on to question number 11. The total energy incident on in one uh, second on a group of solar planets is 120 joule per meter square. Uh, the group of solar planets co uh, converts 720 joules of light energy to 120 joules of useful electrical energy in one second. What is the total surface area of the of the panels, and what is the um, efficiency of the of the system? Sorry, I've, I read so solar planets. It should have been actually it actually should have been uh, panels. So. Uh, let's dissect it. So basically, um, energy that is being incident, um, like on so uh, well, let's dice. Well, basically, solar panels are used to um, convert light energy that we obtain from the sun into electrical energy. So for solar panels, um, it's uh, the information given is that every one second the energy per unit meter square is going to be 120 joules and the group of solar uh, panels converts 720 joules of light energy to 120 joules of useful electrical energy in one second what is the total surface area yeah so basically they want us to find the total surface area and the efficiency of the system so to figure out efficiency, we can just, um, we, we have these values, um, 720 joules and 120 joules. So 720 joules uh, are converted to, of light energy, are converted to 120 joules of electrical energy. So that, that's, that's basically the calculation for efficiency because we know that efficiency, efficiency is equal to useful output by input output by total input total input input into 100 percent if they ask for a percentage which they are in this case so useful output in this case is going to be 120 joules 
so 120 by 720 into 100 so the answer is going to be around 17 percent so we can immediately eliminate options b and c so among options a and d we have to find out the surface area so the math here is since uh, 120 joules of energy are being converted per meter square in one second and we know that in one second the incident energy is 120 joules sorry 720 joules the incident energy is 720 joules in one second and in one second the um, the incident energy per unit meter square is 120 as such the math should uh, some, be something like um, area since um, 120 we, we can look at the units that um, the energy the joules is 720 joules and 120 joules per meter square so as such the area is going to be one the area is going to be 120 sorry the area is going to be 720 by 120 which is equals to 6 meter square the answer is going to be a as let me re-explain this because um, in one second in one second um, 120 joules are incident per meter square per meter square and in one second we know that 720 joules are incident in total in total so therefore uh, the total area should be this 720 by 120 equals to 6 meters square so i hope there there aren't any more any confusion about this uh, if there are please leave a comment and i'll try my best to um, solve it okay um for question number 12 uh 1000 watt uh, and 240 volt electrical device is switched on how much energy does it use in five minutes so we have electrical power which is 1000 watts and 240 volts which is the voltage so um, so um, we don't really need this 240 volt value um, it's basically 1000 watts means 1000 joules per second as such for five minutes it should be 1000 into into 5 into 60 so it should be something like 300,000 joules Sorry, I missed a zero, 300,000 joules. So the answer would be D. Clear? Okay. So let's move on to the question number 13. So a building has walls made from wood and steel. What describes the way in which thermal energy is transferred through the walls? Okay. Let's first read the options. Um, conduction through wood by the movement of molecules through the wood only. Um, not really because uh, thermal energy do, uh, is being transferred through steel as well, not only wood. So um, A is not going to be the answer. Let's look at uh, option B. The conduction through the metal by both the vibration of particles and the movement of electrons through steel. Um, yeah, this could, this is a compelling answer. I mean, this could be the answer because it's yeah because it states that the uh, that the conduction is through the metal. Uh, in the process of conduction through the metal, both the particles are vibrating, vibration of particles, and the movement of electrons. 
as such, um, yeah, th this uh, this should be the answer. But let's look at the other options first. Um, conduction through wood by both the vibration and a movement of molecules through the wood. Um, not really, because wood molecules cannot really move. So as such, um, C cannot be the answer because um, wood is solid, right? So solid uh, molecules uh, vibrate about in fixed positions. They don't move. Um, let's go to option D. Um, convection through the metal by movement of electrons through steel uh, through the steel only. Um, convection only occurs in fluids. They do not occur in solids. So D is not going to be the answer either. The answer has to be B. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Question 14. So, a liquid in glass thermometer is 2 cm long at 0 degrees Celsius. The column expands by 10 cm when heated to 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, for measuring from P, this is important, from P, how long is the liquid column at 30 degrees Celsius? So, um, since we know that um, it is a liquid in glass thermometer, uh, liquid and glass thermometers have a linear relationship with um, the change in temperature. So we can just apply unitary method here. So as such, let's um, let's apply the unitary method. It's going to be um, since it's written that 10 centimeter is expanded when it is heated to 100 degrees Celsius. So um, for 100 degrees Celsius. The change in length is 10 centimeters as it is increasing from zero. So for one degree Celsius, the A should be 10 by 100. And for 30 degrees Celsius, the length would be 10 by 100 into 30, which is 3 centimeters. Now, it would have been the answer. Three centimeter would have been the answer if um, if we if we are measuring from zero degrees Celsius. But the question has asked us to measure the length from P. So P adds another two centimeters over here. So we we have to add two centimeter over here and then um, another three centimeter over here marking the 30 degrees Celsius so when we add those the length from P is going to be option C okay let's move on to the next question question number 15 in many applications a thermocouple is used to measure temperature instead of liquid in glass thermometer which th uh, property of a thermocouple is a major advantage um, for a thermocouple thermometer, um, a thermocouple thermometer is used mainly to uh, measure uh, high high temperatures, like for example in blast uh, blast furnace or in high temperature reactions and stuff like that. So as such, that is uh, its main advantage. So uh, let's look at the options. A greater heat capacity. Um, not really. I mean. It's not really expanding or anything. It's just, yeah, it's not, it, it's, there are not, there are no thermometric properties uh, like, um, for example, mercury or alcohol. It, the main th uh, thermometric property over here is voltage. So that doesn't really have any heat capacity. So we don't really melt, we can't really melt or boil it. So heat capacity does not really come in here. So A is not going to be the answer. It has a smaller temperature range, um, quite the opposite really. So B cannot be the answer either. Uh, C, it's quicker response time. Could be, could be. And D, it, is, uh, it has a non-linear output. Now, it does have a non-linear output. But that's not really an advantage, is it? It's more of a disadvantage. It makes it harder to calibrate the thermometer. So D isn't going to be the answer. The answer is going to be C. OK, so let's move on to question number 16. A liquid in glass thermometer consists of a bulb containing a liquid which uh, expands into a thin capillary tube. The liquid in the thermometer is replaced by the same volume of a different liquid that expands more for the same temperature rise. Um, emphasis on this line um, that expands more for the same temperature rise. Okay. The length of the capillary tube remains the same. How does the new thermometer compare with the old thermometer? 
So basically, it's stating that this thermometer has been replaced by another thermometer, which has the same length, length, uh, which has the same length, but the um, but the liquid expands more for the same temperature rise. So since it's expanding more for the same temperature rise, we can assume that it is more sensitive since it is reacting more to the same temperature rise. So it has greater sensitivity, so it cannot be a C or D. It has to be between A and B. And since the length of the capillary tube is the same, and since it's expanding more for smaller temperature rises, we know that um, it's not going. It's not going to have a very large range. So as such, the answer should be B. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. Um, what is the usual symbol and what is the unit for the heat capacity of an object? So essentially the uh, symbol for the heat capacity is going to be a capital C. This represents heat capacity. Heat capacity. And small c represents specific heat capacity. Specific. And for the unit um, heat capacity, the unit for heat cap, uh, the definition for heat capacity is the amount of energy that is required to um, change the temperature of an of an object by a deg by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So from the definition, we can derive that the unit is joules per degree Celsius. So the answer is going to be A. If the question asked for a specific heat capacity, then the unit would have been, then the unit would have been, um, sorry, um, then the unit would have been um, joules per degree, sorry, joules per kg per degree Celsius, joules per kg degree Celsius. But since it's asking for heat capacity, it should be uh, A. Let's go to question number 18. Which row describes the arrangement of particles and the forces between the particles in a solid? Um, so since we're dealing with an object which is solid, we know that the particles are in a regular arrangement. They are not irregular. Uh, the particles are an irregular arrangement in liquids or in gases mainly. So the answer isn't going to be C or D, it's between A and B. And the forces between the particles are strong. So the answer is going to be A. So pretty easy. Let's move on to question number 19. A wave in the sea collides with a cliff. A crest of the wave hits the cliff once every six seconds. The horizontal distance between a crest and the adjacent trough of the wave is 4.5 meters. Uh, what is the speed of the wave? So let's draw the wave first. Um, let's draw the wave. Imagine this is the axis. Uh, it's not really straight, but anyways. Um, okay, this is the wave. So it's it is it has been said that the horizontal distance between the crest and the adjacent trough is 4.5 meters. So this is the crest and this is the adjacent trough. So basically they're stating that this, this uh, distance is this distance is 4.5 meters. Now we know that uh, to the wavelength of a wave is um, for, uh, the distance between two adjacent crests. So as such, um, we can figure out that the wavelength is going to be, the wavelength lambda is going to be 4.5 into 2. So it's going to be 9, since uh, the distance between a crest and the, and the adjacent trough represents the uh, half the wavelength. So the wavelength is going to be 9 meters. And it said that... Um, the crest of the wave hits the cliff every once every six seconds. 
So since one crest is hitting every six seconds, uh, we can assume that six seconds, this is the time period. Time period. period. So from here, we can, um, we can find out frequency, which is F equals to one by T. And as such, it is going to one by six, and the frequency is going to be the frequency is going to be 0 0.17 hertz. So uh, we have the frequency, we have the wavelength. We can easily find out the speed using the formula V equals to F lambda, which is 9 into 0 0.17. So let's multiply. And the answer is 1.5. The answer is 1.5, so it should be D. Okay, let's move on to the next one. A sound wave ref uh, refracts as it uh, passes the from air to water. Which quantities change? Um, one thing that we we should note about refraction is that frequency is always constant because frequency depends on the um, uh, frequency depends on the source. So frequency is co constant. Frequency is constant. And we know that V equals to F lambda. Now, wavelength decreases. So since wavelength decreases and frequency remains constant, velocity should also decrease. So since velocity is decreasing and wavelength is also decreasing, the answer is going to be B. And frequency remains constant. So the answer is going to be B. Uh, they've asked for change. If, if they would have asked for decrease as well, uh, decrease, the answer would have been speed and wavelength as well. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next one. Um, Question number 21. An object is viewed from a thin converging lens. The diagram shows the paths of two rays from the top of the object to an eye. Here is the eye. And how does the image compare with the object? Now, uh, since we can see that the um, rays are converging at this point, the rays are converging uh, behind uh, the object, so since it is converging, the object is somewhere around here. So since it's, it is converging at behind the object, we know that it is a, we know the following properties that, first of all, it is upright. Upright. We know that, we know that it is um, uh, imaginary. which means it doesn't exist since it's forming in this side. And we also know that it is magnified. So this is basically a magnifying glass. When you see this orientation and when you see that the, um, that the rays are converging behind the object, we know that uh, it works similarly to a magnifying glass. So as such, the object is going to be larger, sorry, the image is going to be larger and it is going to be upright. It's not going to be inverted. As such, the answer would be B. So um, let's move on to the next one. Question number 22. Um, a ray of white light enters the prism as shown. Which row is correct? Um, Wave properties observe dispersion only, refraction only. Um, over here, we see that um, we see that both light has been dispersed and refract refracted because see light has light has been dispersed into two rays. Actually, not two since it's white light. It's been dispersed into. Uh, whole spectrum but here it's showcasing too so dispersion is occurring and refraction is also occurring as it is traveling through a medium as there is a change in the um, angle so the answer is going to be between 
it's going to be between C and D. And let's look at the second column. Uh, frequency of light compare a red light compared with the frequency of blue light. Um, frequency of red light is always going to be less than the smaller than the frequency of blue light because as we know um, regarding the um, electromagnetic spectrum um, red light is on the further end in terms of the visual visual uh, visible light so it has to be um, option c since red light has smaller frequency and greater wavelength, whereas blue light has greater frequency and smaller wavelength. Okay. So let's move on to question number 23. Which, wave are not which waves are not part of the electromagnetic spectrum? So um, let's look at the options, radio waves, television signals, ultrasound, and ultraviolet. So obviously it's going to be ultrasound because sound waves are uh, are longitudinal waves. They are not transverse waves. They are not electromagnetic waves. So uh, many people would confuse this with television signals, but television signals are actually carried out using microwaves for your information. So it's not going to be B. The answer is going to be C. So let's move on to question number 24. A man stands between two tall buildings, P and Q. He is 50 meters from P and 200 meters from Q. He sounds a horn. Basically, he's standing here and he's blowing the horn. And he hears the first echo from building P. And one second later, he hears the first echo from building Q. Uh, what is the speed of sound calculated using this information? So basically, the sound uh, is traveling from here to here and then back again and it's traveling from here to here and back again yeah so it went from uh, i should draw this uh, better excuse my drawing actually i'm not very good at it um. okay so it's something like this um, excuse the drawing again I'm sorry for my bad drawing uh, so basically the sound waves are traveling from the horn to building Q and then echoing back and it's also going in this direction as well it's traveling to building P and then echoing back to the person again so so to calculate the speed of so we are given this information and it's we are also given the information that um, he hears the echo from building Q one second later than the he hears the uh, one second after he hears the echo from building P. So uh, we can write the um, we can write this. So let's assume that um, so here let's let's do the math. T one let T one be the um, time taken to hear from to hear echo from building P building P and T2 is time taken from Q. So we can write T2 minus T1 equals to one second. That is one equation. Um, let's write another equation using a different color. Um, okay. So let's we can we can write the uh, another equation over here using this information. We know that um, 
the distance traveled by the sound over here is 100 meters. So we know that S equals to VT. So 100 equals to the velocity of sound into T1, whereas for, for this one, it is uh, it is traveling 400 meters. So 400 equals to V into T2. So we have this equa second equation. We have this third equation. So from these three equations, we can find out the velocity. We, we can find out the speed of sound, which is V. So um, let's, let's do the math. Let's do the math. So let's do the math over here on this side. I'm sorry, it's, uh, since the equations are on this side though, let's do it over on this side. Okay. So basically, um, let's let's make V the subject. Yeah, let's make V the subject. We know that, sorry, le let's make T the subject. So from equation one, we can write From equation 1, we can write T2 equals to 1 plus T1. So if we plug this in over here, we can write 400 equals to V into 1 plus T1. So um, over here, we can make T1 the subject, which is T1 equals to 100 by V and if we plug this and if we plug this value over here we can figure it out um, it's getting a bit congested so I'm shifting over here we can write um, 400 equals to V into 1 plus 100 by V. So and now if we solve this 400 equals to V plus 100 we can find V equals to 300 meter per second. So the answer is going to be B. 300 meter per second is the speed of sound you calcul use it calculated using this information. So let's move on to the next one. Um, if there are any questions, if there are any queries about this one, uh, please make sure to inform me in the comments and I'll try my best. Okay, so let's move on to question number 25. Sound travels at different speeds in each uh, of the three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. Which row shows where sound travels fastest and where so uh, sound travels the slowest? So. The fa sound travels the fastest in solids, actually, because in solid, the medium is very dense, uh, denser compared to liquids and gases, so the answer is going to be D. And let's go to question number 26. What is one of the uses of ultrasound? And this is also a general knowledge question, and it is going to be cleaning jewelry. Let's move on to question number 27. Which material is used for the core of an electromagnet? So for an electromagnet, it is essential to uh, so that the, uh, the core is a temporary magnetic material. So the only temporary magnetic material over here is going to be iron. Aluminium and copper are not magnetic materials and steel is a permanent magnetic material. So it has to be iron which is C. So let's move on to question number 28 and um, as far as of, as far as I'm concerned uh, this chapter has been omitted from the syllabus so I'm not going to uh, solve this. So let's uh, skip it and go to question number 29. 
which devo uh, device involves the use of static electrical charges um, this is also a general knowledge question it is going to be a a computer hard disk drive um, a motor doesn't really use static electricity oh sorry 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 um, uh, it is going to be a photocopier machine not, uh, not a computer hard disk drive sorry my bad yeah, it's 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 a photocopier not a hard disk drive and uh, not a motor motor uses electromagnets same goes for transformers it uses uh, an iron core yeah so let's move on to question number 30 okay an initially uncharged copper rod is placed in a uniform magnetic electric field e the rod is parallel to the field which uh, the diagram shows the changes induced in the rod Char sorry, charges induced on the rod so since the direction of electric field I is in this way electro uh, the, the positive charges are going to move according to this direction so as such the positive charges are going to be on this side so it cannot be a it cannot be D I sorry sorry um, it cannot be a and it cannot be um, it can it cannot be C it cannot be C it has to be between B and D it has to be between B and D so among B and D um, there is one key difference which is that in B there is no negative charge Rem remember it's been written that um, the copper is uncharged. The copper rod is uncharged. As such, um, it's going to have both positive and negative charges. They are not going to escape. The charges may uh, may move to different parts of the rod, but in the but it's localized within the rod. As such, um, the negative charges are missing. It this makes it look like as if the copper rod is fully positively charged with which it's not so it's not going to be it's going to be D okay. let's move on to question number 31 the diagram shows a simple electric uh, circuit which row describes the change a, char a charge on an electron and the direction of electron flow through the resistor well, it's pretty easy. Convention, conventional current is going to go this way. As such, um, this is the direction of conventional current from positive to negative. Conventional current. And so the electrons are going to move in the opposite direction. Electrons are moving from negative to positive flow so um, it it is going to be from y to x as such um, a we can immediately um, eliminate a and c so between b and d uh, well, it's pretty obvious that the charge on an electron is always going to be negative. So, yeah, it has to be, the answer has to be B. So, let's move on to the next question. When the flash of a, of a camera is used, a charge of 1.5 coulombs flows, through, uh, flows for 0, 0 0.003 seconds through the flash lamp the average voltage across the flash lamp is 3600 volts what is the electrical energy supplied to the flash lamp and what is the average power supplied well the for to find out the energy we have to use the formula voltage equals to energy per unit charge energy per unit charge so if we make energy the subject e the subject it is v into q q stands for charge so we know v is 3600 and charge is
We know that uh, V is 3600 and the charge is 1.5 coulombs. As such, energy is going to be equal to energy is going to be equal to 5400. We can immediately eliminate both A and B. So when it comes to power. When it comes down to power, um, we know that electric power P equals to VI. Now, we know what V is. We don't know what I is. So, and we also, to find I, we use the formula I equals to Q by T. So, Q by T is 1.5 by 0 0.003. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it scrolled up for some reason. So let's is going to be zero zero three as such the I is going to be I is five hundred amps, I believe. I is five hundred amps, so we uh, we input we input this into this equation, put this into this equation, and we get three six zero zero into five hundred. And the answer is one point eight. Sorry, one point eight into ten to the power into ten to the power six. The answer is going to be D. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. What is the unit of potential difference and which measuring instrument is used to measure PD? Um, it's, it's quite easy. Um, the unit of potential difference is going to be volts and the instrument is obviously voltmeter. So quite an easy question, freebie basically. The answer is D. Let's move on to question number 36. The diagram shows four circuits. Each circuit contains three resistors of 100 ohms. Uh, which circuit has the smallest total resistance? So for this, um, let's individually calculate the resistances. So we can easily say the resistance over here is 300 ohms for here the resistance is um, 1 100 plus 1 by 100 plus 1 by 100 to the power minus 1 since we know that for parallel circuits um, for parallel circuits we we calculate resistance using using this formula so we can write it is 100 plus 50 since it's identical it's the rate total res total resistance of this of this combination is going to be 50 ohms since uh, they are e identical so they are going to be halved and the resistance is 150 ohms so let's move on to question number c the total resistance over here, since they're all, all in parallel, are going to be 1 by 100 into 3 to the power minus 1. So it's got to be something like... So it's going to be 33.33 ohms. And for D, the total resistance is going to be 1 by 200 plus 1 by 100 to the power minus 1. R is going to be equal to R is equal to 66.67 ohms. Now the question has asked us for the smallest total resistance, so the answer is going to be C. If it asked for us for the highest resistance, it would have been B. 
pretty easy let's move on to question number 35 um, metal kettle is plugged into a main socket the plug contains a suitable fuse the kettle's cable is damaged and the fuse blows why does the fuse blow so let's first look at the questions uh, it's uh, good to know that the um, fuse uh, the fuse is located in the live wire it's not in the neutral wire or the earth wire so uh, let's keep that in mind and let's look at the options a the bare earth wire in the cable touches the bare live wire yes this this is a very compelling option i think this is the answer but still let's look at the other options the metal casing of the kettle touches the bare earth wire um, <laughs> earth wire is always in contact with the um, with the metal casing so that it can carry the excess charge if needed so the, it's not going to be the bare neutral wire in the cable touches the bare earth wire um, not really because there aren't any current in the neutral wire so for D the live wire breaks without touching any other wire um, not really no uh, if the live wire breaks, then the circuit breaks. So um, it doesn't. There, the fuse only blows when too much current flows through it, right? So yeah, it's not going to be D, and so the answer is going to be A. Since if it touches the the if the earth wire comes in contact with the live wire, um, uh, there's going to be an excess flow of charge because um, the earth contains a lot of negative charge. As such. Uh, the flow of current is going to be huge as such so the answer is going to be a since it would blow the fuse so let's move on to question number 36 as a magnet is moved into the coil of a wire as shown there is a small positive reading on the sensitive amateur okay. Okay. this uh, change must increase the si what sorry what change must uh, increase the size of the reading so basically this magnet is uh, being brought closer to this coil so they're asking that um, what change would increase the amateur reading so let's look at the options moving the coil, moving the opposite pole into the coil um, not really that doesn't really affect our reading uh, pulling the magnet out of the coil yeah same same thing uh, pushing the magnet in faster yes this is most likely the answer because um, if we move the magnets faster uh, it is going to induce a higher current and unwinding some turns of the wire that's going to have the opposite effect it's going to rather decrease the current the um, the changes which increases the reading would should, would have been um, one moving the magnet faster which is the which is our answer moving the magnet faster um, more turns in the coil yeah basically these two would have been the uh, main main ways in which you can increase the size of the reading so it would have been answer is C let's move on to question number 36 the diagram shows the current for a model power line and two transformers and a lamp at the output what is the input voltage so for this we have to apply the equation for a transformer which is VP by Vs equals to NP by NS where NP represents the number of turns of coil of the primary coil and NS is the number of turns of coil in the secondary coil. So first we have to look at this setup and then we have to look at this setup next. So for this setup the calculation is going to be um, since uh, this is the primary coil we have to go backwards so this is the VP this is the VS so voltage in the secondary coil so we have to find VP first VP and VS is 24 and NP number of turns in the primary coil is 200 
while number of turns in second recoil is 40. So by calculation, we find out VP equals VP is um, 120 volts. So we know for a fact that over here, the voltage is 120. So now it's time for this this coil now. So let's take another color. So for this coil, this is the VS, this is the VP. So VS is equals to 120 degrees, sorry, sorry, uh, 120 volts, and it has 100 turns. And for the primary coil, it has 10 turns, and, v, and we have to find out VP, which is the input voltage. So we know that VP by 120, which is the VS, is equals to um, 10 turns for the primary coil and 100 turns in the secondary coil. So we know that VP is going to be is going to be 12 volts. As such, the answer is going to be C. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, so for question number 38, the electrical power is transmitted by cables over long distances at very high voltages. This is also a transformer question. What are the effects of having a high voltage transmission system? Um, since the voltage is high, we know that P is equals to VI. Since the voltage is high, so the current has to decrease uh, to may make sure that power is constant. We know that power is constant. So as voltage increases, current decreases. So the answer, so for the second column, it is going to be low current. So it can, the answer cannot be either A or C. It's going to be either B or D. And the power loss in the cables is going to be low as well, since no, we know that P equals to I square R. So if I, is, I decreases, we know that power loss will also decrease. So the answer is going to be D. Note that this power and this power is not the same. This power is the electrical power, whereas this power is the electrical power that has been lost. So, yeah. So, let's move on to the next question. Um, question number 39. The diagram shows a beam of um, electrons about to enter a magnetic field. The magnetic field is directed into the page. What is the direction of the deflection of the electrons as they enter the magnetic field? So for this, you have to use the left-hand rule. So we put our, um, we know that in, our, in the left-hand rule, the thumb represents the direction of force. The um, index finger represents the magnetic field, direction of magnetic field. And the middle finger represents the direction of current. So as such, um, let's we point our index finger at the screen since it is into the page or into our screen, um, and um, the direction of the electrons is going to be the the opposite direction of the direction of current. So if we do that, we see that our thumb is pointing down the page. So the answer is going to be D. Since if uh, since if the thumb is pointing down the page, the force on the electron is going to be downwards as well. So if the force is downwards, it's going to be something like this. So let's move on to the next question, uh, which is our the last question of this paper. In the geiger marsden uh, experiment, alpha particles are fired in a thin gold sheet. Most alpha particles pass straight through the thin gold sheet. A few are deflected. What can be deduced from this experiment? We can deduce that since most of the alpha particles have passed through, um, uh, one deduction that we can make is that the um, is that the atom is cons is made up mainly of empty space, as most of it is um, traveling as most of it is traveling through. 
we also know that um, since it is some of them are deflected we know that it has uh, there is a nucleus which is very small and which has a positive charge so the, these are the three um, these are the three conclusions that we can make so let's look at our options the nucleus is very small yes that is one of our conclusions and I think this is the answer uh, but let's look at the other options as well the nucleus has no charge which is wrong the nucleus is a positive charge uh, since it is reflecting the alpha, alpha particles um, electrons surround the nucleus um, yeah we cannot really uh, know that through this experiment since they don't affect the alpha particles at all and electrons have a negative charge no again we cannot deduce anything about electrons in this experiment so the answer as I had um, figured out earlier is going to be a so that was it for May June 22 variant 11 um, if you found the video helpful please leave a like and um, share any queries if you have in the comments and I'll see you on the next one.